Okay, we are live. We're going to let this stream breathe just for a second here, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome in to the Huddle Up podcast presented, as always, by Mile High Huddle and powered by Overtime Media. I'm your host, Chad Jensen. With me, as always, my partner in crime. You know him. You love him. He is Zach Kelberman. Zach, it was interesting last night as we finished up Wednesday's podcast, literally as we were finishing it up. The Dallas Cowboys, and now obviously it's a Denver Broncos podcast. I get that. But Alden Smith signs with the Dallas Cowboys, which to me was ironic because I would say probably over since free eight in the weeks leading up to free agency to the present, I probably received a dozen DMs from fans asking, well, why don't the Broncos go after Alden Smith? What about Alden Smith? Alden Smith, now he's off the market. So that was interesting to see that deal take shape. Yeah, apparently they've been courting him for quite a while now, and uh, he's getting himself clean, literally and figuratively. He's he's cleaned up his act, multiple off-field arrests, I believe eight arrests since 2012, and uh, he's been suspended since 2015, but he'll be reinstated soon. And if the Cowboys can harness what he brings to the table, I mean, 47 and a half sacks in his brief career, he was once upon a time, Chad, the premier young pass rusher in the NFL. If they can harness that potential, they got some. You know, the the I remember during his peak years in San Francisco when he was with Vic Fangio, the question was always, you know, is he, is his 19 and a half sacks he got? It seems like that one year, 19 at least though. Um, Was that a product of Fangio? Was that a product of the tandem he forged working with Justin Smith at the time? Like there was a lot of people who believed it was superficial production because of what Justin Smith, the attention Justin Smith demanded. And when I say, when we're talking about Justin Smith, we're not talking about how Bradley Chubb and Von Miller are, they play opposite each other, basically the same position. It was more like, it'd be more like saying Derek Wolf helping out Von Miller, but obviously a different, completely different scale. Justin Smith was an all pro. He was a guy that as a five tech defensive end could push for double digit sacks. And he would take a lot of attention away, giving guys like Alden Smith one-on-ones. So you know, we haven't really seen him have that level of of success that he had early in his career. And of course, he's had a, a lot of off the field stuff. But a part of me has to wonder how much of that was true, that criticism of the time that Justin Smith was to basically the explanation for his two or three win- year window there where he was really productive. Yeah, there's always those unsung heroes, those underrated contributing players like Justin Smith. But Alden Smith, if you watched him on the edge, he was just beating linemen one-on-one. He had power. He had speed. I mean, he was really the gold standard among the up-and-coming edge rushers in the NFL. And uh, we'll have to see what he can bring to the table in Dallas. I mean, it's a great opportunity for him. They just lost Robert Quinn there. And uh, it's uh, you know, it's a nice comeback story for a guy who's been through the ringer the past couple of years. Indeed. And I'm a guy that believes in second chances. I'm a guy that believes in forgiveness and especially when the person seeking forgiveness shows a uh, penitent heart, if you will. So wish, wish him the best down there in Dallas and guys, we got a lot to get to tonight. Of course, it's the mile high mailbag. We are your football priests and each and every week we look forward to offering you the absolution and answers to your burning Broncos questions. We're going to get to what's on your mind here very, very soon. First, though, just a couple of quick matters of business, guys. As you know, make sure you're following the podcast on Twitter, at HuddleUpPod. Stay plugged in. Don't miss anything. If you ever have problems finding the stream links, all that stuff, as long as you're following on Twitter, you'll never be left in the dark. And while you're at it, make sure you follow Mile High Huddle on Twitter as well. And also, this is a message to our listeners who are going to be checking out this podcast after the fact on Apple Podcasts. Make sure you take some time, leave a creative review, five-star rating if you like what Zach and I are doing. It's a great organic way to support the show. And again, our our podcast continues to climb the charts on Apple Podcasts, on the American football chart, that is. We're in the top 50, and that's thanks to all you guys. So we appreciate each and every one of you. We're not just speaking to the Apple Podcast audience, but each and every one of you. But if you are in that Apple Podcast audience, take some time, leave a creative review. Very helpful. All right, Zach. I'm going to grab this question here from Richard, who jumped in early with a super chat. And then I want to get your take on something Drew Locke had to say today about the Melvin Gordon, Philip Lindsay dynamic. First, let's grab Richard real quick. Appreciate that donation, Richard. Thank you, Richard. $20 jumping off the top rope. Appreciate it. He says, thoughts on bringing a few players on the show, doing some Q&A with the super chatters. Could generate a lot of money for COVID-19. Oh. Oh, Chad. I did it, dude. <laughs> you broke the uh, spell. 
charity or other deserving charity. Bring on Locke, Lindsay, Sutton, Vaughn, et cetera. You know, it's something that we're definitely, you know, right now it uh, would probably be pretty hard to do because team PR departments are scattered all over the place right now. And it's not a very, it's not the usual unified operation for NFL teams because of what's going on. However, um, you know, that's something once things perhaps return to a level of normalcy, we can look a little bit more seriously at. As of right now, though, we kind of got to make the best of our situation and uh, kind of roll with the punches. Yeah, that's true about the issue that's going on around the country, around the world right now. It's kind of scattering everyone. Everyone's doing things remotely. And this is the crunch time for NFL teams, even with what's going on. The draft is coming up. The pre-draft process is playing out. So it's going to be a little trickier than usual. But maybe when things are normalized and stabilized, we can look forward to that or look into that further. Richard, jump back in again. Appreciate your donation. He says, just an idea for an interesting show. Love the pod. As always, guys, keep up the good work. Hashtag Broncos country. Hashtag state of being that's definitely something we will uh take a little bit closer to heart it's not easy to organize those ducks and get them in a row but we'll see what we can do zach um drew lock so of course he's he's holed up at, in his hometown with his staying at his parents house because of what's going on i already spilled the beans and said the word that shall not be named because we know what it does to our reach on on youtube especially but because of that, he is kind of holed up and and doing the best he can to, to weather the storm like everybody else while trying to stay loose and throw a few times a week at his workouts and study Giants film of Pat Shermer's uh, scheme that he's going to be running here very, very soon. And he was asked by Phil Milani what basically his take is. In fact, I want to I want to get the context right. He said, when asked whether the Gordon edition will be good for Lindsay, Locke said, quote, I mean, it's like Michael needed Scottie Pippen, right? We all need a little help here and there, and that'll be good for us in the passing game too, close quote. And he went on to say a bunch of other stuff. But, Zach, I thought it was a great way to kind of a savvy way as a leader to inject a little levity, you know, compare a very touchy, intense situation to all-timers like Jordan and Pippen. My question (laughs) to you is, which one's Jordan and which one's Pippen? That's a good question. The hyperbole is crazy on this uh, this comparison, though. I, I would say, <laughs> based on the production, based on the resumes, I happen to say uh, Philip Lindsay's Jordan and Gordon's going to be Pippen. But I I just think that's how it's going to be. It's going to shake out. I still think Lindsay's going to make the most of his opportunity. And I've gotten a lot of pushback on my Melvin Gordon takes. I'm not going to go into my rants today about him, but I firmly believe that Lindsay will outplay him on a big gainer, big play basis. For what it's worth, I do think Locke, when he said Michael needed Pippen, I do think that uh, he was comparing Philip in that sense to to Michael and, of course, Gordon being being Pippen. But if what we're hearing is true from the Broncos, that they want Gordon to be the bell cow, we'll see how that shakes out. Like Philip Lindsay said a couple days ago to Mike Kliss, you know, I'm not going to just let somebody take my job. He's going to have to battle and and take it literally from Philip Lindsay. And so far, I mean, no running back that's ever crossed paths with Philip Lindsay has been able to do that. So it'll be interesting to see how that dynamic shakes out. And yeah, I mean, for what it's worth, guys, look, when it comes to analyzing this situation, more than one thing can be true at the same time. Talking about the Melvin Gordon edition, it's not a zero sum game. It's not all or nothing. There are things both of us like about Melvin Gordon edition and there are aspects to it. We don't like, we don't need to rehash all of that, but let's, let's have some perspective here. It's not all or nothing. And Nick, by the way, that's that's cool, man. We've got to keep those supply chains uh, operational, and we appreciate what you're doing. Drive safe, my friend. Uh, hauling that fuel. Whoop! Dang it! There, there it went on me doing one of those jumps. Bear with me one sec, guys. I hate it when that happens. I got to reach out to Streamyard and see. Dang it! Can you can you pull up um, the next one after? See if you what you can reach. I can go up. Richard second comment there and let me scroll down it goes so fast that we just uh it just jumps really quickly yeah it skipped it skipped a big uh i, I can can't. circle back and do it a different way but i can't yeah i can't go up that far all right so in that sense um let me grab really quick i'm gonna pull it up on youtube grab this one here from david who jumped in on a, a 15 dollars donation on super chat appreciate you dave yeah that's great thank you david we, we do appreciate that he says is eli apple now a possibility since the raiders deal fell through and uh 
Not my favorite cornerback prospect, Chad. I don't know how great he would fit the scheme. He has some character issues, and I don't think he would mesh personally with Vic Fangio. I don't think that's the type of player that he would like to bring on to his, his you know, secondary. My preference is still Prince of Mucamera. And the, the fact that he's not signed still, the fact that Broncos did not choose to sign him, leads me to believe they have bigger plans in the draft or they're comfortable with their current cornerback corpse. But maybe you uh, have a differing opinion on Eli Apple. I just don't think he's a great scheme fit for Fangio. Yeah, I don't love it. I don't love Eli Apple as a uh, fit for the Fangio scheme. I think he's, you know, honestly, as a former first round pick, I think he's really uh, underplayed as he hasn't quite lived up to his draft stock. I would still prefer Zach if the Broncos, and I do think the Broncos need to make one more cornerback addition. Yes. It sounds like they're thinking that's going to end up being in the draft, but if they decide to go to the veteran pool, I'm still Zach all about seeing what can get done with uh, Prince. I'm with you on that. Even Drake or Patrick, we got some questions from Kenneth and uh, Ian. Any thoughts on Drake or Patrick? I, I like him a lot more than I would Eli Apple. I think he'd be a little more expensive, Kirkpatrick, than uh, Prince of Mukamara, but I, would I wouldn't mind him as well. I'm with Chad, though. They have to supplement that secondary with one more veteran cornerback and then add into it with the draft. If they do those, those two moves to the cornerback corpse, they will be set for 2020. All right, let me see if there we go. So, select start, my friend. Wow. I that's... regret that we couldn't show your actual card because the stream passed us by, and that really irritates me. I wish there was a workaround, but unfortunately, there's not. So, this is the next best thing. We really appreciate that donation. That's that amazing. Means a ton to us. Thank bro. you. He says, uh, Thanks for all the podcasts. I listen to them every day. Just asking, should the Broncos trade for a wide receiver if the big three are off? the board Zach if the big three are off the board and he's talking about oh I'm curious now actually that's what Trade I was wondering for a receiver are you talking about on the veteran market or are you right. talking about maneuvering in the draft but I would assume you're talking the veteran market and I would say no I on that and there was a little uh because there's plenty of talent to be had after the big three in this class you guys we talked a lot about it lately from Denzel Mims to Brandon Ayuk from Arizona State to I mean even uh, LaVisca Chenault at CU there's a lot of attractive options that would fit what the Broncos need right now for that wide receiver two slot. And there was even today, um, what was it? Uh, Mike Kliss talked on the, on one Oh four, three, the fan. I can't remember which show. Normally I like to credit whatever show someone appears on, if I'm referencing a radio hit, but he talked about that the Broncos actually were in on Nelson Aguilar. Thank mm. goodness that didn't happen yeah. because I would have, that's probably a move I would have panned. I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of Aguilar and, Frankly, I don't understand how that would fit the, you know, speed demon slash, you know, jitterbug explosive penchant that they're looking for on that uh, wide receiver spot. If Broncos fans were mad about uh, Deshaun Hamilton's hands or lack thereof, his butterfingers, they would have hated Nelson Aguilar. I mean, he has a problem with drops consistently. He's not a speed demon. He really does nothing overly well. So I'm glad the Broncos never pursued him. To answer the question, though, if they miss out on the big three, I wouldn't trade for a receiver in this year, this year's draft class. Like Chad said, you can get one in the second round, get one even in the third round. I wouldn't mind moving up for one of the big three, a few spots for Judy, a few spots for Henry Ruggs, but failing that, I'm not giving up capital for a second-tier wide receiver. Mark Langley, it's been a minute since we've seen you, my brother. It's good to, uh, good to see you. Appreciate that donation. As you know, Thank one you. of our Super Chat superstars dating back a long time. He says, just wanted to say what's up, my guys. Hope everything is well. Tough times right now. But good to see you both are doing well. Keep in touch. The same goes for you, Mark. And I hope things are okay on the home front where you're at there and that uh, professionally everything is holding holding together for you. A lot of our listeners have uh, been bitten by what's going on here in the employment uh, side of things. And hopefully, in your case, you're you're holding up. It, it's, uh, it's good to see you. Let's grab Jason here. He says, thanks for all you guys do. Keep it up. $5 Thank donation. You, Appreciate, Appreciate you. you. Jay bone. Um, all right, let's grab one or two that are not super chat. A lot of comments. Let me grab some questions that are not super chat here. Well, while I'm going down the stream, I'm just going to go what, what comes next as far as comments, questions, J bone jumps in $5 donation. Thank you. Jason. Appreciate that. Jason LSU wide receiver. Justin Jefferson is rated number four and another great option. If the big three are gone, a lot of teams need wide receivers. I don't know if you'd be my number four. He's really good. He's really good, but yeah, he's one of those options. Honestly, I think he probably 
uh, is a little too close to Cortland Sutton's skill set to be the more, most ideal fit at number two. But just today, the MMQB, which of course SI and the whole nine yards, they had the Broncos trading back from pick 15, all right, to pick 21 with Philadelphia. I think they got a second round pick is all they got in exchange for moving from 15 to 21 with CD Lamb off the board, with Jerry Judy off the board, Henry Ruggs sitting right there. They trade uh-huh. back in this MMQB mock. And who takes Henry Ruggs? The Philadelphia Eagles at pick 15. In real time, unless all of this has been, Zach, just an intense smoke screen, it is the lying season after all. We know that teams really try and work the misinformation this time of year. But this has never really felt that way to me. It seems like the Broncos really are intent on getting that wide out in the first round, and they have their heart set on Henry Ruggs, even though any one of those three would be phenomenal fits. And I think one of them will be there. I just don't know which one it's going to be. Yeah, I'm with you. And I don't get these mock drafts that think the Broncos are going to pass on Henry Ruggs to trade down or take a linebacker. I mean, he is arguably the wide receiver one in this draft class. If he falls to 15, the Broncos should not even think about it. They wouldn't have to trade up for him. They would get their guy instant impact player. It it just makes too much sense. To answer the question, though, Justin Jefferson is not my wide receiver four. That would be Mims, Chad. I really like his skill set a lot. And I wouldn't trade down for a receiver. If the Broncos move down from 15 to the 20s, take a center. Take a defensive lineman. Take an inside linebacker. Don't take a receiver when you can get one in the second round and then add another player on different side of the ball, different position in the first round. That MMQB mock, they, they took the LSU linebacker, Patrick Queen, who would be a phenomenal fit in Fangio's defense. And if they did trade back like that, I would be all about them grabbing an off-ball linebacker if they picked in the back third of the first round, yeah. whether it be Queen, whether it be uh, the kid from Oklahoma, I always forget his name, Murray. Kenneth uh, Murray, or the guy I like a little bit later in the draft, Akeem Davis Gaither. Bronx legend jumps in, $5 donations. Good Thank to you. see you, my friend. And it's good to know who you are on Twitter now as well. I will be tagging you after this podcast, so look forward to that from the uh, main account. Let's grab Ian here on Facebook. He wants to know, what do you guys think of Chase Claypool? Honestly, um, the kid, the tight end Waller from, from Oakland, well, Vegas, whatever, the Raiders, that's who he reminds me of, Zach. Really raw, talented, explosive athlete. A little bit small for a tight end, but still probably ends up playing tight end at the next level. Very, dy- I think he has a chance to be a really dynamic player, but he's still very much in raw form. He needs he needs to be developed a little bit more. Definitely a move tight end prospect, but the Broncos have their own raw, semi-raw tight end. Noah Fan, they just invested a first-round pick in the guy. So like, like we always say, if there's one tight end on the roster that's going to get the lion's share of targets and reps this year, it's Noah Fan. Everyone else is a distant second before him. So Claypool's a nice... You know, a nice prospect, but not one the Broncos should seriously target, at least in the uh, in the early rounds. Jeff Cohen jumps in, five dollar donation. Appreciate that, Thank my you, friend. Jeff. One of our super chat superstars. He says the verdict is still out on Pat Shermer. His offense was never better than twenty third in the league. Good at quarterback development, but let's see how his scheme <laughs> will fit in Denver. It's fair to pump the brakes. Um, I think that the best case scenario for Shermer. And I hate to bring up Case Keenum, but you saw what his offense, if it's really being, if it's really humming at all levels and firing on all cylinders, even the most average quarterback like Case Keenum, you can get to the NFC Championship game. Now you put a dynamic quarterback behind center, you you got your tackles pretty much locked in, health willing. You bolstered the interior, you add additional weapons. There's a good chance this offense can be better than than and I think they will be better than 23rd in the league in 2020, just based throw Shermer out of it just for a second. Just based on the talent alone, I think this offense is going to produce above 23rd in the league in 2020. Jeff's echoing a point I made right after the Shermer hire. It's good on paper, but I want to see how that plays out on the field. I want to see how it plays out with all the pieces coming together. And the one thing that I questioned about Shermer in New York, Saquon Barkley was his predominant running back. It was like a 90-10 split. So they bring in Melvin Gordon. They're going to make it more of a 60-40 split, 55-45 split. It doesn't really add up to what Shermer tra- tra- traditionally has done with a run one running back system. If he can get Drew Locke the next level, if he can put all these pieces in place, and if he can call consistent game plans, vertical attacking offensive plays, it would be a success. But I want to see it happen before I credit him and say he's an upgrade over Sangarello. I'm just excited to see how it translates to Locke because, man, if a guy like Daniel Jones can produce 24 touchdowns in 12 starts, whatever it was, I think it was 12 starts, 
I just shudder to think what Locke can do. Bronx legend jumps back in. Here's his actual question from that super chat. What's good, fellas? Thanks for the love, Chad. Can Locke cure tensions if there is any, by the way, or between Gordon and Lindsay? And I really do think that, yes, that's part of what he – that's one of my takeaways from what his remarks were in that one-on-one -on -one with Phil Milani talking about Drew Locke is that, you know, it's one thing to diffuse a situation. It's another thing to do it with savvy and – because no matter who you're talking about to be compared to Scotty Pippen, to be compared to Michael Jordan, whichever one wants to pretend they're that person. I mean, it's just a really cool way to kind of inject some levity into the situation, kind of be a peacemaker. It shows what a true leader is. I think once these guys all get in the same room though, Zach, I don't think you're going to have those resentments between each other. If, if, right now, Philip Lindsay has a resentment. It's not toward Melvin Gordon. It's yeah. toward the front office. So I think they're going to jive. I mean, Philip Lindsay is a phenomenal teammate. His teammates love him, and they always have. So I think it'll end up smoothing out, and Locke's just that type of leader to kind of help accelerate that a little bit, bring guys together. You know what cures tension in the NFL? You know what cures anything in the NFL? Winning. That is the number one ingredient. It doesn't matter who you have in the locker room. You can have Tom Brady under center, Aaron Rodgers, but if there's – a losing spell, if there's a losing streak, if there's just bad juju in the locker room, it's going to bring the entire team down. I don't have any question that Locke is the alpha personality of the franchise quarterback to, as you say, Chad, raise all ships. But if they win, it's all good. If they start losing, then the Lindsey wheel starts getting squeaky more, and, and Melvin Gordon maybe starts getting a little uh, dis disenfranchised. If they can win, everything will be okay. And, and if they can win with Drew Locke being the primary benefactor, even better. Winning cures all. You know what they say. Rod TV jumps in on YouTube. I'm ready for the next Danny Trevathan in Akeem Davis Gaither. Second or third round. Get rid of Todd Davis. I watched his film talking about ADG a lot, and it kills me how much teams, maybe talking Todd Davis, watched his film a lot, and it kills me how much teams kill us with tight ends and running backs, destroying that as a weakness. Yeah, I mean, that's the one thing that a guy like um, Davis Gaither, Patrick Queen, Murray, they are really fast sideline to sideline guys. They excel in coverage, and that would definitely be something that the Broncos haven't had for a while since Danny Trevathan. That's a that's a really good point, Rod TV. And but I'll say this though, honestly, we didn't see the tight end be quite as much of a, an Achilles heel in Fangio scheme yep. as it was traditionally in those man uh, press man coverage schemes under Wade Phillips and then Joseph and Woods. Mm -hmm. Except for Darren Waller, who just feasted against the Broncos consistently. But it's a part of the question I get, Chad, about the Bron Broncos fans want to draft a linebacker to stop Travis Kelsey. You're never going to stop Travis Kelsey. You're never going to hold him to zero receptions for zero yards. He is always going to get hits. He's always going to get yards. He's going to probably score. You just have to hope to contain him. And I think with Vic Fangio's defense, even with Todd Davis, they can do that. Just for the reason you mentioned, Chad. They were better last year than the first couple years under Vance Joseph. And if they can just add to that, they can maybe scheme around it. They have Justin Simmons. They have the horses on defense. They can contain the opposing tight ends. They'll never stop the Travis Kelsey types, though. Never. Yeah, I mean, he's a guy that was going over 1,000 yards as a tight end with Alex Smith thrown in the rock. That's I mean, right, yeah. that's, if that's not a testament to the dude's talent, I don't know what is. And now you put Patrick Mahomes, it's a matter of limiting. It's a matter of containing. You're never going to shut him down. And by the way, bringing up Vance Joseph, condolences to his family. They lost uh, Mickey Joseph, his brother, who's a coach uh, oh. at LSU, to this whole thing that's going on right I now. We that. all know what we're talking about. That's that's awful. I read that on Twitter that. earlier today. So condolences out to to the Joseph family and yeah. those affected. Marcos jumps in on Super Chat. Appreciate you, my Thank friend. You, Marcos. Do you think we will have a top 10 offense and defense this year? Go Broncos. Top 10 and top 10 on both sides of the ball. I think there's a chance. I think – Honestly, there's – I don't know. If it was top 15, I would I could feel a lot more confident saying, yeah, there, you, you, there's a good chance top 15 both sides of the ball. Top 10, I'm not saying it can't happen, but I want to see – honestly, Fangio's defense last year was one of the few things – it galvanized toward the end, but that early, that early stage of that season, his defense really disappointed me. I mean, I think we all expected more going four weeks without a sack, four weeks without a takeaway – four weeks without a win. Um, so I don't know. We'll see. If everything comes together, then absolutely. But you're banking on a lot of dominoes falling just right to have a top 10 on both sides. And if you do have a top 10 on both sides, Zach, 
you're going playoffs. deep into the playoffs. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, and my best case scenario to piggyback off what you were saying, Chad, top five defense because the Broncos, statistically in most areas, they were not far off from that last year. I mean, they were really coming together. They were starting to be cohesive. They were starting to find their groove toward the later end of the year under Vic Fangio. So top five defense, and I would say a top eight offense. If it's the year of Drew Locke this year in 2020, there is no reason why. You add a Henry Ruggs. He has two running backs. He has Cortland Sutton. He has Noah Fant. The offensive line should be better. If Locke can take that next step or two, there's no reason why they can't get into the top 10 or maybe even the top eight. So that's my best case scenario. My worst case scenario, the floor is a top 10 defense and a top 15 offense. I'm just very high on what Drew Locke can do this year if all the pieces come together and this coaching staff is as improved as Denver is indicating. Stu McPeak, so consistent, super chat, superstar, Mount Rushmore at MHH. Appreciate you, my friend. Thank that you, donation, Stu. you know that means a lot to us, brother. Um, all right, let's grab some here. Let's grab Dennis here on YouTube. Assuming the top three wideouts are gone, as well as Isaiah Simmons, would you consider trading up a few spots to get Werfs, Mackie Becton, or uh, Jedrick Wills, or just wait to see what's there at 15? Mm. If Werfs is if Werfs is there, Zach, I would at least check to see what it would cost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just I wouldn't I would take him at fifteen, but because the Broncos technically have two starting tackles right now, I wouldn't trade up for a tackle when you could stay at fifteen and get a receiver maybe or get a defensive lineman, get a cornerback, whatever inside linebacker. They don't need necessarily an offensive tackle at 15. They need either a guard or a center. They don't have a starting, depending on where Glasgow plays, I guess a center. If they're going to trade back, rather than trade to get you know someone like Cushenberry, I would not trade up for a tackle. 15, I can think about it, but I wouldn't move up to get that guy. Buana Beast. And by the way, Buana, I will, uh, my brief response via email last night, I'm going to follow that up with some more detailed thoughts. I've just been slammed uh, today. So, yeah, we'll talk more, but he says, should the NFL consider adding some time, uh, back some time on draft selections, considering the state of a draft room possibly. So adding more time to the clock on, you know, selections, you get X amount of time. What do you think? It's not a bad idea. I mean, it would compensate for what the teams lost in the pre-draft process. They can't host prospects. They can't get a feel for them. It's still going to be a very regimented process the way it plays out. They're still going to have to be on a strict clock and they're going to have to know going into their picks, all NFL teams, who they think they want at that spot. I wouldn't mind increasing it by a couple minutes, but anything more than that, you're dragging the draft out for four or five hours, and that would just that would be more detrimental than it would be productive. Ben Fuller jumps in with a ten dollar donation. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ben. It's good to see you. He says, Thanks for everything you guys do. Take care and go Broncos. Wow, thanks, buddy. That uh that's awesome. Anthony jumps in, five dollar donation. He says, you, If Denver Anthony. decides to trade back, same as last year. Who is somebody that they would take later in the first? Well, I think if they trade back, it's a sign that this has all been a smokescreen about going after a wide receiver in the first round or the top three are gone, right? You got the Judy, Lamb, and Ruggs are all gone by the time the Broncos are at 15. So if that's the case, either one of those scenarios, when they trade back, I think, you know, I kind of panned the MMQB mock today when I was – writing about it at milehighhuddle.com. You guys can go check out that article. But honestly, if they trade back to that point, I'm seeing what's there at offensive tackle. I'm seeing what's there at off-ball linebacker. Like if I can get yeah. Queen or if I can get Murray, I'm taking a hard look at that. I'm seeing about a corner. Actually, I'm looking at a corner before I'm looking at a linebacker, whether that's uh, you know Jeff Gladney, C.J. Henderson. We'll see how the board ends up shaking out. And then I'm worrying about a, a wide receiver in round two. If I'm moving back, I think I'm going to target a center. You just have to invest in Drew Locke's line. You have to protect the guy, and they don't have a starting center right now. So if it's not a receiver, I still hold firm to my belief it has to be an offensive lineman. Whether that's a tackle or a center, it will be dictated by how the board plays out. But if they want to move back, I'm thinking either off-ball linebacker, I'm with you on Murray, I like him a lot, or I'm targeting a center like Cushenberry somewhere in the 20s. Ed jumps in, super chat, superstar. Appreciate you, bro. That ten dollar donation, he says the Broncos and Locke will destroy the Chiefs this year. What do you guys think? DB for life, hashtag state of being. Hey man, look, we don't want to lie to you and tell you something we don't think is true. Like I'm all about optimism, fan optimism, orange colored glasses, but we're also here to give you the truth. I think the best case scenario for the Broncos in 2020 is they split with the Chiefs, destroy the Chiefs. I'm just I'm just giving it to you, real Edward. I love the optimism and. 
anything's possible, especially if, like we talked about, if these dominoes fall the way that the Broncos are hoping they will, anything's possible. But you got to look back through the prism of history. The best predictor of future behavior or future results are past results. And that's not a, an absolute, Zach. That's not saying things don't ever change because they obviously do. And the NFL is – that's one of the great things about the NFL is it's parity each year. First to last, last to first. We see it on in both conferences each and every year. But I'm saying – a more realistic expectation, Ed, is splitting with the Chiefs. You win at home, you lose on the road. If they can do that, it's a massive step forward. I'm not going to discount the Broncos having a chance to sweep the, the Chiefs, especially if it's Drew Locke's here. I mean, they should have beat the Chiefs with Case Keenum if they would have just connected with Dem- Demarius Thomas on the sideline. They're, they're always going to be beatable, and I, especially for a team like the Broncos who knows the Chiefs well, having played them twice a year. Fangio's defense can contain Mahomes, but as always, it's can the offense match points? Can they have enough production to get on top of the Chiefs. I believe they will split this year, and I believe they could sweep them, but destroy Mahomes is the best quarterback in the NFL by far and away a large margin, and it's going to take a lot for the Broncos to even split, let alone sweep. If they can split, that's a good situation for Fangio in 2020. Thank you for the question, Ed. You know, uh, we appreciate that, my friend. The the uh, stream did a jump, so I am going to – you guys know how much I hate having to do this, but every once in a while, and especially a really busy night like tonight, it's going to happen. We got a vault, Angela, right here, who jumped in with a $14 donation up in Canada, proving, as always, Broncos country is not a geographic location. It's a state of being. It's wherever you are. It's a state of mind. It's a state of being. Appreciate you, Angela. She Thank says, you. do you require Broncos permission to have someone on the show, or is it or is it that you contact players through them? Look forward to you having some of the players on. Um, technically, the way you're supposed to go about it is through the, the team's PR department. Now, there are exceptions to that where you can go through a player's publicist or a player's agent, but teams prefer you all communications with players under contract funnel through the PR department, through their communication center. So, in other words, teams like to be the ones who are the gatekeepers on who dis- on deciding who gets access to their players and who doesn't. So in our case, it would probably end up being a little bit of both in terms of if we ever end up having choosing to have p- players come on the show, it would be going through probably both channels, but primarily through Patrick Smythe and, and um, Eric Schubert and those guys. Who we have a pre-existing relationship with, so it, we're yeah. just we're just keeping a good relationship between the Broncos front office and our brand, our pod, and the whole Mile High Huddle umbrella. Uh, Bronx legend jumps back in again. Thank you, my Thank friend. You, um, grab this one here really quick, Zach. I've got to grab a few more that the stream passed by, and while I'm loading those up, answer this question here on Facebook for Dario. Yes, sir. Dario asked, uh, with Melvin Gordon signing, all you hear about is Lindsey and Gordon. Where does that leave Royce Freeman, though? It leaves him the distant third. I mean, he's going to fight for scraps. He'll make the active roster. They need him just for depth purposes, but he's a super cheap number three guy. Can He can spell Melvin Gordon. He can pound it on early downs, goal line situations. He'll get some touches, but he is the new Devontae Booker. He is relegated to strict third down or third string duty where he doesn't see the field much at all. So it's the Philip Lindsay, Melvin Gordon show. And then down here, way down here is Royce Freeman. It sucks for him, but it's just the way the business goes. I'll say this though. It will be interesting to see, you know, we, we believe this is going to have a galvanizing effect on Philip Lindsay, right? He's going to rise to the occasion. He's going to battle competition brings out the most in, in players and competitors. I'm curious to see what kind of galvanizing effect this has on Freeman, because this wasn't so much an indictment on Lindsay, the Gordon edition, or a referendum on Lindsay as it was Freeman. I'm curious to see, Zach, whether or not it ends up sparking some kind of a change. The problem is you're not going to have very many opportunities to see whether it did because it's going to be the Lindsay Gordon show unless one of them gets banged up. That's a really good point. I didn't really consider about it pushing Royce Freeman as well. But if I'm Royce, I'm thinking about my next team I'm playing for, Chad, because they, they bring in Philip Lindsay. He's the star. They bring in Melvin Gordon. They get rid of Devontae Booker, and he still can't get his. He still can't be the featured role, the featured player. And the Broncos seem to have abandoned that completely after last season. They realized Royce Freeman is not a workhorse. It's not the guy they thought they were getting coming out of college. That's why they picked up uh, Melvin Gordon. So if I'm him, I'm looking at it like they don't really think I have that potential. Let's see if I can prove them wrong. Walter Drills, 
We can't show your actual super chat card because the stream passed us by, but we appreciate your donation, my friend. He says, don't worry, fellow Broncos fans. I made a voodoo doll of Mahomes. <laughs> we will win the division this year. Oh, and hey, guys, take my <laughs> Appreciate you're, you. You're, you're always good for a laugh, too. You and Mark yeah. Langley always bring out a smile. And when it's this size of a uh, contribution, wow. you know, it really chaps our hide that we can't vault your wow super chat card. But Dylan Smith, thank you so it's much, amazing. my friend. I mean, that's unbelievable and you know that goes a long way and means a lot to us my friend we will keep an eye out in the stream for any questions that you might have um thank you man that's that means a lot to us yeah send them through be sure to answer them appreciate you dylan miss christy checking in mount rushmore she's yeah. on it at mile high huddle we appreciate you thanks and it's really good to see you um what's this one from mark anthony I truly love the donation aspect of the show. You guys definitely deserve it. That being said, would it be possible for a once a week Q&A for non-super chats? Not salty. You guys honestly deserve it. You know, that's something we can definitely take into consideration. And, you know, there's things that we were, uh, were talking about and considering. Buona Beast, the mayor of this community of on MHH on YouTube, you know, he has a few suggestions. We're, uh, we're, we're considering it. and But it's worth mentioning, Zach, that we try to – you know, the more the show continues to grow and people are as generous as they are, are great listeners, it's hard sometimes. We don't want to leave them out in the cold when they're right. putting in a question live, but but we do try to balance it with non-super chats throughout the show. One thing everyone needs to kind of at least try and understand or sympathize with in a certain sense is we're never going to be able to get to each and every question no matter what, just because there's only a finite amount of time in every podcast and every day and I wish we were in a position where we could just do like Joe Rogan for three hours, but I think even eventually you guys would get sick of us. Yeah, for anyone who watched me on my old 24-7 Facebook Lives, I said the same exact thing. You can't get to every question. It's impossible. You try to answer the most uh, you can in one sitting, and then we can come back and maybe attack the question on the next pod or answer it on Twitter. But we try to perform a balancing act, Chad. We try to incorporate Periscope, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. We try to get to everyone. Unfortunately, some are you know left to the wayside, but we can definitely explore that and think we can do a exclusive non super chat kind of show. Absolutely. And there's also different things that, you know, we can work on like creating open form written mailbag questions where you can submit it. Maybe we can, I don't know. I'm, we're working on things where we can try and be as available to everybody as we possibly can that we promise you. Luis jumped in also the stream passed him by. Appreciate that. He says, Thank go you, Broncos. You are the man, dude. We really appreciate that. And then, I want to grab Steve real quick, but it's going to take me a second to load. Why don't you grab this uh, Miller 707 champ? Okay. He asks, uh, since Derek Wolf only signed a one-year deal with the Ravens, do you think there's any chance that we could re-sign him next year? I think that door is pretty much shut, Chad, and, and dead bolted and locked. And, and, you know, the Broncos and Derek Wolf made their peace with each other. And when you look at Elway's history, he really does not bring back former players, especially high profile former players. The way Derek Wolf was talking, he thanked the Broncos for his, you know, giving him a chance. The Broncos thanked him for his contributions. That is always a sign of a permanent divorce. I don't see a reconciliation next year. Yeah, I mean, He's the type of player, though. He might not be quite high profile enough, but he's the type of player that I could see when he does hang up his cleats, coming back, signing a one-day contract to retire as a Bronco. Like Derek Wolf is an extremely loyal person, and even though it's this, we're seeing the unfortunate side of the business side of the game. This team means a lot to Derek Wolf and what they did for his life as a player and the money he made and the success he had as a pro yeah. starting his family, the city of Denver, like the whole nine yards. He loves Denver. And I think you're going to see him come back in some capacity eventually, just not as a player, Zach. I think he actually could retire next year, Chad. It can, it can, depending on how the Ravens season goes. I mean, he's been dealt with some career threatening injuries. He won a Super Bowl. He has, he's made enough money. I can see him walking away after next year. He gave it one more shot with the new team and, uh, and that's that. Steve jumping in from the top of Mount Rushmore with the ten dollar donation. Thank you, Steve. It's good to see you, bro. I'm sorry we can't show your card, but you know uh, we're giving you that shout out. We love you. We appreciate you more than we can say. Um, all right, let's grab. Uh, I don't want it to do another one of those stupid jumps. Let's grab. Looks like Ben has another question. Appreciate that donation, Ben. He says on a tugboat pushing gasoline up and down the East Coast as essential business. 
Really appreciate being able to stay up with what's going on with the Broncos. Thanks for everything. That's important, you guys, with what's going on right now, just like over the road, being on a tugboat. We all need gas in our cars, even though a lot of us are um, dialing our, you know, you know, social distancing is a thing for a reason. A lot of us are dialing back our activity and a lot of us are at home, not working at all. But we need to keep the supply chains open. And guys like Ben and those who are in that that side of things, whether it's uh, on the ocean, whether it's across America's highways, it is vitally important to keep everything copacetic that this that the Walmarts continue to get filled up and that the you know the gas stations continue to have what you need when it that is time for you to fill up the gas tank. So we appreciate you, Ben. Stay safe out there on the sea, my friend. Yeah, you know, it's not just, of course, the healthcare workers we have to thank, but we thank, or I personally thank any frontline worker, Chad, Walmart, people on delivering fuel, anyone who's out there standing in front of people, interacting with people, risking their health during this crisis right now. I, I really appreciate all you guys. And uh, from the smallest job to the biggest job, it is not unnoticed. David jumps back in. Appreciate that, Dave. He said, is there a chance we move up to get Okuda? since we have not signed a corner. I mean, you never say never, Zach, but I really, I think they have, I think they're going to add a corner in the draft. I really do. But trading up to get Okuda, you're probably going to have to get into the top five and you're paying the farm. That's like giving up the type of capital it would take to get a quarterback in this class. And so, you know, if for some weird reason he falls to close, like to eight, nine, and he starts falling a little bit, you would be remiss to not pick up the phone if you're John Elway and at least check with those teams on what they'd be willing to accept to, to trade up. But I don't see it as a realistic possibility. I think Broncos fans for the most part need to go ahead and remove Okuda as a possibility for this team. Yeah. He's not falling to 15, nowhere close to that more than likely. And I'm not trading up for the guy as good as he is. They just need uh, um, other positions to be filled before cornerback. They need another corner, but they can wait on that. They cannot wait on a center. They cannot wait on a tackle. They cannot wait on a wide receiver. Those have to be addressed first before you start attacking the other side of the ball. Hey, Brian, I didn't see one of your questions, but it might be because this thing skips around on us. So if you want to resubmit, we'll try and catch it a little bit later on in the stream here. Uh, discount audio and wheels jumps in $10 donation. Thank you. DAW. Appreciate that, bro. Hope everything's going okay with the shop. It says Gordon money. Blah. Should have signed a wide out with that money and paid Lindsay draft O line wide receiver. First rounder bus po- draft O line wide receivers in the first round bus potential are high. Get O line protect lock draft a receiver in the second or third round. Keep, it up, fellas. Appreciate you, DA Dub. Yes, sir. You know, that brings up a point that honestly, you know, the 2014 wide receiver class was pretty phenomenal, right? In terms of the, I mean, the Broncos were like the only team that drafted a, a wide receiver in the top 100 that year that busted, and it was Cody Latimer. But if you look at the wide receivers after 2014 drafted in the first round, it's a pretty sad list of guys who have not really lived up to their draft stock. So I think that for people who are skeptical, about taking a wide receiver and it being a high probability for bust. There's enough evidence to suggest that the last time there was really studs taken in the first round, you know, multiple studs, it was 2014, Zach. And where are we now? We're six years removed from that. So it's a fair point. Yeah, but I wouldn't say that offensive linemen are immune to having bust potential. The Broncos have one right now in Garrett Bowles. He kind of proved that it could be the case as well. I tend to agree it's a safer pick usually and definitely a premium pick investing in your quarterback, but they're definitely it's just as risky as drafting any other position. So if they want a receiver, if there's one at 15 that they really love, pull the trigger, get your guy, and don't don't deliberate. John on Facebook jumps in. Appreciate you, brother. He says, Hello, fellas. Would you think we could trade a second and a third to get in to to trade back up into the back end of the first round to get two players in the first? And if so, which players would you get? State of being in Baltimore, right on, man. Good nice. to see you. Glad to know you're you're out there in Baltimore. Um, could that happen? A second and a third? Yeah, absolutely, that could happen. I would say, you know, like a dream scenario for me in that scenario, at pick 15 and let's say they like trade up and get into like pick 30 or something. If that were to happen and they could get Tristan Wirfs, if they could get even Javon Kinlock 15 and later on grab, I don't know, Denzel Mims maybe late in the first round. You got your first round receiver. He's a first round caliber player in my opinion. And you got a key crucial 
probably the one defensive lineman with the highest upside in this class. He's, you know, he's, he's got some bust potential to him because he's still quite raw, but Javon Kinlaw could be the next Chris Jones. Yeah, I would not bring around that. I would not mind that in the least, Chad. But my best case scenario, and I would love this, and I think it could be a legit possibility the Broncos moving back up using some of their third round capitals to get back in the in the first round. Rugs at fifteen and then in the twenties get someone like Cushenberry. You're satisfying the offensive line, you're satisfying the wide receiver core, and Drew Locke is one happy, happy quarterback. Speaking of Drew Locke, Kevin G wants to know. What key pieces do you think the Broncos need to unseed the Chiefs? Now, the reason I say speaking to Drew Locke is for the Broncos to really close the gap with the Chiefs, it all comes down to is Drew Locke the truth and does he take that next step as a second-year quarterback? I think he will, which is why I think it's fair to say that the Broncos could split with the Chiefs. But as far as missing pieces at this point, it's a matter of I think you're never going to completely stop Patrick Mahomes. I think you saw what the best-case scenario is in terms of that, which game was it? Uh, I think it was the home game, the game that the Broncos should have won if Case Keenum does not overthrow Demarius Thomas, running down the right sideline, mm-hmm. under 30 points, under 27 points, actually. And that's that's the best you're ever going to do, limiting Patrick Mahomes. So what does that mean? you got to be able to fight fire with fire. you yes. got to be able to throw down blow for blow. So get that wide receiver that you need. But I'm telling you, it doesn't necessarily have to be at 15. I'm definitely fully in agreement with you. A lot of Broncos fans seem to think that defense is the way to catch up with the Chiefs and stop the Chiefs. No, offense is the way. Getting that wide receiver, getting the Broncos version, their own Tyree kill chat, that is how you take down the Chiefs. That is how you match points with them, and that is how you beat them. we got a question about sweeping the Chiefs. That is not going to come close to happening if the Broncos don't have that wide receiver too. They don't have that offensive weaponry. They would get swept by the Chiefs. They wouldn't sweep the Chiefs. So, So the way to take them down is not by drafting an inside linebacker. It's by drafting a wide receiver and an offensive line min or two and showing up that offense and going to work and taking down Patrick Mahomes. And by the way, Joe, I just showed your, your question or your comment there. Don't even worry about it, dude. We're just happy to have you here participate in the conversation, being a part of the community. It's all good, dog. Mr. Ranch, $5 donation. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you. Excited about the new Broncos culture. However, I'm concerned about Elway making tension or creating tension before contracts. Pay Lindsay. Yeah, and that's basically, that's one of the messages that got lost amongst the people that were wringing their hands over how strident Zach's response was to the Melvin Gordon signing or what it's been over the last week is that, look, the Broncos didn't necessarily need that bad juju, right? They didn't need this tension. They didn't need this drama. And Elway created it. That's what's so frustrating about this whole thing is Elway didn't have to keep that open as a possibility when he was initially asked about it on December 30th, Zach, and yet he did. So hopefully it could be put to bed soon. And once they get in the room, you know, the the players, as I mentioned earlier in today's show, I think they'll galvanize around each other, close ranks, and everything will be okay. But you still wish Philip Lindsay could get his. And But now, again, what are you going to do? pay two running backs seven, $8 million exactly. a year. Like now it's, that's untenable, dude. That would be dereliction of duty almost. And that's why it's such a miscarriage of justice that that money didn't first go to Philip Lindsay. Very well said, Chad. Yeah, it's one thing or the other with John Elway. It's either don't make a comment about Philip Lindsay and then get Melvin Gordon or pay uh, Philip Lindsay and don't get Melvin Gordon. But to dangle that carrot over his head, then go bring in a running back for $16 million. It just sends the wrong message. I'm not going to go on a tangent right now. You guys all know how I feel about Melvin Gordon. We just have to hope, like I said earlier, the Broncos win. If they can win, we won't even hear one lick of tension, one lick of controversy if they start losing. Then the Philip Lindsay questions, the narratives, the reporters start asking questions. Then it has the potential to get ugly. We just have to hope they can work in harmony and the Broncos stack up those W's. Amen. All right, let's grab – Let's now we're running out of time. We're at 49 minutes, and there are a lot of questions and super chats that are stacked up. So – not that we don't want to give each question it's it's due, but let's try and rapid fire some of these. From Mark Anthony, he wants to know, does the Shermer offense feature two running back sets, having 30 and 25 on the field at the same time, could be deadly? I mean, there are some cases of that happening, but mostly it's single back sets. But I think you'll see, especially in the red zone, Zach, I, th- I think you'll see Shermer get creative and try and use every playmaker available <clears throat> to him. And sometimes that might be having Philip Lindsay and, and Melvin Gordon whether it's a two back set in a shotgun next to Drew Locke, one splits out and, you know, forces the defense to try and contend with both and figuring out what they're both going to do. Do you hand it off? 
do you throw it over here? Do you throw it over there? Right. It's it's pretty exciting what the possibilities that could unfold as long as you got the right design guy and as long as you got the right trigger man. And I think they got it for sure the right trigger man. And then you got Noah Fant, who's a big red zone target. Cortland Sutton, big red zone target. I, I don't want to say it's bad having too many weapons, but only so many mouths can be fed. So if Shermer can scheme and keep everyone happy, hats off to him. But in the red zone, at least for decoy purposes, having Lindsey and Melvin Gordon in the same backfield can surely be a positive. Ron Dub jumps in. Super chat, superstar. Thank appreciate you, Ron. you, bro. Hey, guys, which Bronco free agent do you think will have the biggest impact in 2020? That's a good question. Also, did you see Ware's prediction on Chubb, 2020, a year of progress? The second aspect of that first, yes, I did. We had a story on it. I think Luke Patterson had that story at milehighhuddle.com. You guys go check that out. Demarcus Ware kind of making a bold prediction for Bradley Chubb, taking that next step, being more consistent. I think Chubb's on deck for a really good year, provided he doesn't have any setbacks on his knee. But getting back to that question, which Broncos free agent do you think will have the biggest impact in 2020? You go first, Zach. The easy answer is Darrell Casey, and I'm sure he's going to be a hit in the Vic Fangio defense playing in between Vaughn and Chubb, but I'm saying Glasgow. It all starts with the offensive line. It all starts up front. It all starts with Drew Locke, and getting him was such a big boon for Drew Locke's 2020 chances. I love the pickup. I don't think the Broncos overpaid. It's not another Juwan James. He's consistent. He's reliable. He's very good at his job, and he will pay immediate dividends even though he won't get the credit for it. I think there's an argument to be made for any of those three, speaking of Glasgow, speaking of Casey and A.J. Bouye. But I'm going to say Bouye now, obviously not a free agent, mm. acquired via trade, he and Casey as well. But I think Bouye, if he is the player Vic Fangio believes he is, and if he's the fit for this scheme Fangio believes he is, I think you could see him bounce back with a kind of stud Pro Bowl type of performance in this scheme. I mean, we've seen wide receiver, uh, cornerbacks excuse me, in Fangio's scheme at times in his career – put up crazy numbers on the interceptions. It didn't happen for the Broncos last year, but they were severely depleted at cornerback in terms of depth and talent. And everyone was still learning quite a bit. Fangio's scheme puts a lot of pressure on you between the ears, and it took time for people's brains to catch up to their bodies. So I like I think Bouye, if he is the, pl- the person that, the, that Fangio believes he is, he could end up having the biggest impact. Uh, let's grab this one here from Ian real quick on Facebook. Would you take Brown... Derek Brown from Auburn at 15, if the big wide receivers are gone? That's a really good question. I think an even better question is, in tandem with that, is at pick 15, big three are gone. You got option to take Brown or Kinlaw there. If you're going to take a defensive lineman, which of those two would you take? I think Brown has the higher floor, but but Kinlaw has the higher ceiling. Yeah. But generically speaking, yes. And if he was there at 15, you count your lucky stars and you and you take Brown because he's a plug and play starter. Whereas Ken Law, you know, it's gonna take two, three years probably to really turn the corner and fully develop. I mean, I would consider it because, like Chad said, him getting that talent at 15 is just remarkable, but I don't know how much, if it would be a luxury pick or not. You bring in Darrell Casey, you bring back Shelby Harris, you bring in, you bring back Purcell, your defensive line is pretty well stocked. If they didn't bring back Shelby Harris, it would be one thing, but if the receivers are off the board, I'm looking at an offensive lineman, I'm looking at an inside linebacker, I'm looking at maybe a cornerback. Defensive line, for me, would be a really you know lower priority kind of target. I think this is a really salient observation and that probably ends up coming out exactly like this in the wash where Lindsay from Larry here. Lindsay's name. Did you lose me right there? I, I got you now. It was lagging for a second. I can hear you on my side. It did one of these black circles and which is weird because I'm hard lined into my uh, modem. All right. Let's mosey through this. I think the uh, internet gods are starting to put a little pressure on us here. So let me jump down. Being punished grab- for saying the word that we shall not say, Jack. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Let's grab Terry. Appreciate you, Terry. So Thank consistent, you, Terry. my friend. You guys are now getting my pint after work money. Keep it rocking, <laughs> MHH, and all of Broncos country. Hashtag football priest. Hashtag state of being. Well, you know we appreciate you, Terry, and what you mean to the community and how consistent and outgoing you are. That means a lot to us, my brother. Buy yourself around, Terry. You definitely deserve it, man. We appreciate it. Yes. Oh, then there it did its thing. All right, hold on a second. Bear with me one sec, guys. Zach, grab Kevin, and I got to go over on YouTube, see what we missed. 
Okay. Kevin uh, jumps in with a $5 donation. Thank you so much, Kevin. Definitely appreciate you. Uh, he asked, appreciate you, bro. Dalton Reisner was one of the best last year on the line. Do you see him continuing being a beast? Yeah, I have. That's one player on the Broncos I have no concerns with. He was just scraping his potential last year as a rookie. He is going to be a perennial pro bowler, potential perennial all pro. I have no concerns, no qualms about Dalton rising in year two. He is only going to get better. He is a franchise 10 year starter. Love the pick, love the player, love it more by the year. Man, I'm starting to get, I don't know if it's on your side or my side. I'm starting to get a really disrupted um, sound. You keep breaking up and I don't know, like I said, I'm, I'm plugged in hardwired, but there's been some weird things with the internet lately, and I think it has to do with just how much more of a demand is on yeah. the internet with everybody being at home. Yeah. Um, Reisner's going to be a beast, Kevin. Absolutely. He's one of those perennial Pro Bowl caliber guys. Hopefully he doesn't have a Derek Wolf type of trajectory where he plays at a Pro Bowl level but never quite makes it into the All-Star game. But I think he will because I think he has kind of the personality too that's going to help him out a lot as kind of an ambassador for, for himself and for the team. Uh, so we shall see. Now, hold on one second here, Zach. Brian, the super sticker. I've never seen mm, one of these before. Picture of Zach Kelberman in his profile pic. Appreciate the donation, Brian. That's awesome. Jeff jumps back in. Zach <laughs> is like Nick Wright a little. Hashtag speak your mind. I'll take that as a compliment. I like Nick's, Nick Wright's work. Appreciate you, Jeff. All right. We got to grab Terry, and then it jumped to Cottonmouth78, which we aren't going to be able to show the can do is this, guys. I'm sorry that this happens. I wish it didn't, but... Until we find another solution, and this is what we have to do, and this is how we show you, give you your props. Cottonmouth78, appreciate that. He says, was looking forward to Locke and his wide receivers and other teammates getting together and getting some gel time in this offseason, maybe gelling on Madden. Hey, it's I, I agree with you. That's one of the unfortunate collateral effects of what's happening right now, but who knows? if this If this whole thing ends up, you know, if life goes back to normal at the end of the month, there's still going to be plenty of time for them to get a little time in outside of the OTAs and, and what's going to take place in May. Knock on wood, Zach. Fortunately for Locke as well, a lot of his supporting cast from last year is returning for a year two, except for maybe the wide receiver two who they're going to add in the draft. He still has Sutton, Fant, Lindsey, so uh, the chemistry shouldn't be hurt too much. We just hope that the facilities can be open soon and he can get those all-important reps in just for chemistry and continuity purposes. Man, I'm getting some really bad advice, guys. Um, there are a lot of super chats that are stacked up but with what's happening right now with the stream let me let me jump to the bottom guys i'm gonna ask you a question real quick are you interruption in the sound uh those of you who are still live with this respond let me know if i'm wondering if that's just on my side or if that is let me know guys what you see there bear with us one second brian we love you too thank you appreciate you thank you uh, it's a little bit weird that you have Zach's picture as your profile pic, but we'll take that as the highest form of flattery, eh, Zach? That's it, I guess. <laughs> Boise man, one, 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 one. First time listening live, been listening to the podcast for about a year now. Figured it was time to kick you some gratitude for the great content. Wow. Appreciate that you. That means That's a lot. Thanks, my brother. Thank you. It's good to have you. And the cool thing is, is, you know, right there, you're just kind of checking in with us and whatnot, but... You know, we invite you to participate in the conversation, questions, whatever's on your mind. Nad Ludlow, great job, guys, surviving the, you know what, in Pennsylvania. Certain <laughs> words that we can't say live and that we're not going to say, just to be on the safe side. Whoops. Um, Casey, I came out of the canal bleeding orange and blue. <laughs> and I'm stunned at how little the Broncos are being talked about with how they finished uh, the year and what we are moving forward with. Also, pay Philip. $20 donation. Thank you, Casey. You know, I get what you're saying, but at the same time, it's been three kind of, well, sub 500 years, 
But surprisingly, Zach, there are pockets from a national scope who are really high on the Broncos and what's going on with Drew Locke. And, um, you know, there have been quite a few people who have stepped forward and, and used the Broncos as a bold prediction, like a worst of first. These are This is one of the teams that could come out of nowhere. The way the Broncos ended that season, Chad, on such a high note, they have Drew Locke and him rapping on the sidelines. From that point on, they started garnering national attention, and the Broncos are being picked now to be dark horse contenders and AFC contenders by multiple outlets, and it's so good to see because for you have the franchise quarterback in place, you have the coaching staff in place. Those are the two most crucial components. The Broncos have that, and I think people outside of Denver now are starting to realize Okay, guys, I'm still, I still don't know if you guys are hearing what I'm hearing on my side. It's giving me anxiety because I hate when, yeah, Doug's saying yes, the sound is sometimes sputters. But it's one thing if it's just a little bit here and there. That's just part of what happens when you live stream. Maurice Jackson says it keeps lagging. Dang it. Um, I don't know what we should do here, but, oh, Buona Beast is saying, let's see but the video is messing up. You're lagging. Um, we might have to wrap this one up because the connection is weird. And here's what we'll do though, guys. If we wrapping this one up a little bit early, we hate doing it. And David, we'll, we'll try and grab your question real quick before we bounce out of here. But um, we will find a way. I have all these questions will be preserved on our YouTube um, analytics. And we can either do like an impromptu uh, podcast tomorrow morning or Saturday morning, like a quick session to get these super chat questions in or whatever, but we're not going to leave you high and dry. But Zach, I think with the technical difficulties we're having here, we might be wise to wrap this one up and then circle back and get to these questions uh, another day, even though this is our last pot of this week, yeah. maybe we can find some time this weekend, you and I really quick to get together and do, do a quick stream. Yeah, absolutely. You sound good right now, but it, it's just being very unstable right now. It's, you know, it's, it's going laggy and then picture perfect so we just have to uh roll with it and uh, yeah. wrap this one up early oh and see on on my side yeah zach just completely cut out on my side so guys david taylor gabriel is a cheap death burner we're going to grab that question another time we're playing with fire right now if we did not get your super chat guys don't hate us we're going to come back and get them i promise you um Stay tuned. Make sure you're following the show on Twitter at Huddle Up Pod, and we will let you know how we make this up. Worst case scenario, guys, worst case scenario, we will um, open up Sunday night show with those questions in order. If so, if your super chat hasn't been answered yet, worst case scenario, we will do them first. No holds barred Sunday night, but we'll see if we can't maybe put together a, an additional pod for you guys on Saturday and grab those questions. But Zach, I think yeah. we uh, we got to get out of here for now, and and sorry for I don't know honestly what's going on because I've connected directly into my router. It's just one of those things. But guys, make sure you're following the show on Twitter at Huddle Up Pod. While you're at it, make sure you follow my partner Zach Kelberman at Kelberman NFL, myself at Chad N Jensen, um, our super chat superstars. Guys, appreciate everything tonight, your contributions, and if we didn't get your Thank question. You. Promise you we're going to make it up to you very, very soon. So stay tuned for that. And in the meantime, have a great weekend. Zach, my, my brother, have a great weekend. We'll get together after the show and figure out how we're going to make this up, but we will. Yeah, we will see you guys before Sunday again. We will get to the questions. Thank you for your patience, and uh, sorry about the technical difficulties tonight. Yep. All right, guys. For Zach, I am Chad. Thanks for joining us, each and every one of you, contributing to the conversation, guys. We'll talk to you very, very soon. Make sure you're following on Twitter so you know when we're going to do this makeup pod. Talk to you soon. Have a great weekend. Stay safe. Talk to you then.